13 different times, Jesus said the words, follow me. He called disciples with this simple phrase, two words packed with meaning. What does it mean to follow someone? Walk where they walk? Say what they say? Is it like following a dance leader? Mimicking and mirroring their steps? Is it like following an orchestral conductor? Waiting for your cue and staying in tempo? What do we leave behind? Where will we end up? Jesus simply asks us to trust. So in this holy ground service, you are welcome now to trust and have faith that Jesus leads us well and knows where we are going, even when it isn't clear to us. worship service and as we do I want to invite you to pause the video and just quickly grab a basic cup and fill it with some water and grab a small bowl we're going to use this during our time of prayer so as Christians we strive to follow Jesus right each day is an opportunity to be open to the ways that God is inviting us to follow Jesus 
we follow Jesus in our everyday lives and not just in those times when we come to church or perhaps watch an online worship service. Each time that we show love to a stranger, an enemy, or a friend, each time we invite someone who is lonely to sit with us, we are following Jesus. And we follow Jesus when we offer food to the hungry or advocate for those who are not getting access to the resources that they need to thrive. At the end of his time on earth, Jesus commissioned his followers to go out into the world and baptize others in the name of God. But before that, Jesus himself was baptized, and he modeled for us the importance of receiving God's love. And he lived his life out of this promise that he was a beloved child of God and sent into the world to share God's love with everyone. When we use water in worship... It is a reminder of the God that we try to follow. It is a water, it, this water is a reminder of God's grace and God's love that overflows, even when we may fail to follow Jesus' model. This water that we pour out is a reminder that there is always more love and hope to go around, even when it seems like the sin and evil in the world is turning us away from the ways of Jesus. So I want to invite you during our time of prayer to pour a little bit of water into your bowl. As you touch the water in your bowl, I want you to consider the ways that you have not followed Jesus in your daily life. I want you to consider the ways that perhaps you have shied away from sharing your faith and sharing God's love for fear of judgment or criticism from others. Swirl your fingers around in the water a little bit and consider the sins and evil and violence in the world that we see each and every day. And as you touch the water, pray to God and ask for forgiveness. Forgiveness for you, for all of us, and for the world. Let us pray. Oh God, forgive us. Forgive us when we have ignored or bullied others. Forgive us when we have judged somebody else or saw someone in pain and decided to walk by on the other side of the road. God, forgive us when we have tried to be in control and when we have neglected to let others shine the light that God gave them. Now dip your finger in the water and make the sign of a cross on your hand, saying, God, forgive me, God, forgive us. God, we pray that your grace would work in our world and would work in each of us, bringing peace where there is war, bringing comfort where there is suffering, bringing provisions where there is not enough shelter or food, and bringing hope where there is a need for connection and friendship and community. Amen. Friends, the way of Jesus' life invites us to turn away from sin and to follow the ways that Christ set for us, that we read about in Scripture. We follow Jesus when we offer compassion, when we receive openly and humbly God's love, when we create community, when we offer food to those who need it, when we accept God's forgiveness and when we offer that forgiveness to one another. But we cannot do this on our own. You see, these waters remind us that we are all connected and that first and foremost, we need the waters of God's grace to wash over us each and every day. And we need the waters of God's grace to connect each and every one of us. So, 
rejoice with me in this good news that because of Jesus Christ and the mercy that he offers us, we are set free to follow him and to invite others to join with us in that sharing of love and compassion and community. Thanks be to God. So the scripture I'm going to read for our worship service today comes from the very end of 
Matthew's Gospel. Now this text is Jesus' very last words to the disciples. After he has been crucified, after he was risen from the dead three days later, and now he is giving his final commission, his final words to the disciples. So let's listen up and hear God's word for us today. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you until the end of the age. In Matthew's gospel, just days after Jesus had died and rose again, he offers these words to the disciples to help them see what it will be like to follow him even when he is no longer around. We often call this text the Great Commission, where Jesus is sending the disciples out from places that are familiar and comfortable to them, out into all of the nations to invite others to join them in this way of life that Christ has modeled. Now, beyond these basic instructions that they are going to take with them, I want you to consider for just a moment perhaps some of the mindsets or emotions they might have carried with them once they heard this call. Consider what mindsets that Christians for centuries have taken out into the world with them as they have tried to live out this great commission. Now, when we go into a new place to us, we inevitably take our own understanding of life. We note the differences in vegetation that we see. We note the differences in clothing or customs. And we might get excited about any familiar taste of home that we encounter. Kind of like finding an ice cold Coke at a rural roadside bakery on the long journey from Tegucigalpa, Honduras to the Honduras Outreach Ranch in the valley. When we share spaces with others, whether it be across the street or across the world, it's natural to notice differences and similarities that we share. However, even when we appreciate these differences, there's always a risk that we might carry assumptions that one way of living or thinking is better than another. And there is a risk that we may think that one of us has something to offer while the other only has something to receive. These risks become dangerous when we try to live out this great commission from Jesus. If our assumptions of superiority cause us to disregard the knowledge, the culture, and the leadership capabilities of others. For many years, I have read this passage in Matthew like it was my personal great commission. I felt empowered to know that I was called by name, by Christ, to go out and share the good news of the gospel. I found myself even more empowered when I heard a New Testament professor point out that the word some, in that, word, in that phrase, and some doubted him, is not really all there in the original Greek. She said it could simply be translated as the disciples worshipped and doubted, inferring that as disciples of Jesus, it's okay to have questions and doubts and that nonetheless, we are still called to follow. And I think this could be something important for us to harness as Jesus' disciples today, because none of us have it all figured out. And if we know that we are going forward with questions and wonderings, then we go forward in a position of humility. And it's important, yes, to feel empowered to follow Christ, to be his disciples, no matter the age or stage of life we are in. And so I hope that all of you feel empowered to follow Jesus, just as much as I hope my 11-month-old son, who was baptized a few weeks ago, feels empowered to follow the gospel. We are all commissioned to share God's love for the world, and this doesn't end when we reach a certain stage of life. But if this is the only way that we read this text, then we risk thinking about the Great Commission as this one-way street, only thinking about how this text empowers me 
and not those around me. And if we read this passage as one-sided discipleship and mission, then we will neglect many other important aspects of what Jesus modeled for us. There's a book called Doing Good Says Who that is written by several women who have lived and worked in Central America off and on for over 60 years. They tell the story of some Americans who have worked with indigenous local communities in Guatemala to try to start a school feeding program. Now, in the process of trying to dream up this program, one of the Americans remarked this. She said, I just want to cry when I see how poor they are. I want to feed them. Can't we do something like we do at my church? We buy food in bulk, cook it, and serve it to the homeless every Wednesday night. After hearing the Americans talk about their ideas for a while, someone asked one of the indigenous women what she thought. She said, well, here there's no church kitchen and no bulk food to be found for at least 50 miles. But we can figure something out. I'm not worried about that. What I'm worried about now is that I think we may be seeing it differently. You're seeing poverty. I'm seeing people who want to do something for their kids. You're talking about hand, handing out food, and now I'm talking about helping moms themselves do something for the kids. The conversation then continues back and forth, and the Guatemalan woman says, we are not less because we have less. You see, without meaning to, the Americans acted in ways that conveyed that the Guatemalans were less than. All of their good intentions and sincere desires were not enough to prevent these individuals from overlooking the ideas and the culture and the worth of those that they were trying to work with in Guatemala. And this book highlights the importance of respect and relationships when we are trying to do good, or in other words, follow Jesus in the world. And it also highlights how important it is not to just evaluate the success of a program, but also ourselves when we are participating in mission and when we are seeking to follow Jesus in our daily lives. And so I want to invite us to reimagine this commission that was given by Christ, to reimagine what it means to follow Jesus and carry his mission out in the world together. You know, on the surface, Matthew 28, I'll give it to you, it sounds kind of like a Christian missionary huddle speech, right? Everybody put your hands in. Okay, now go out, make disciples, baptize, teach them. God is with us on three. Ready? One, two, three. But when you dig into the original context and the language of this text, the meaning and understanding of this commission, it just gets a lot more complex. And there's a lot we could say about this particular scripture, but here's what I think is really important as we journey towards reimagining how we follow Jesus and practice Christian mission. It's that the verbs in this text are meant to be ongoing. You see, they come in this grammatical form that means that they are continually in process. And when I revisited and had a conversation again with that same New Testament professor, she told me that she prefers this translation to be disciple them, not making disciples. Kind of implying that all of us are a part of it and that according to Matthew, mission is not this hit and run kind of evangelism, but more of a lifelong process of Christian formation. Mission and following Jesus is not a one-time event or a quick fix. It's a longer, continually pro continual process of being formed as Christ's disciples. And you know, when you stop to think about it for a moment, you have to think about those first disciples who, before that point, often didn't quite understand what Jesus was talking about. And now they have this commission, and you have to think that surely they still needed just as much formation and practice living what would become the Christian life as those that they would invite to come and join them, just as much as we today need to look back and learn from the example of Jesus 
so that we can follow him too. Expanding our perspectives on the Great Commission helps us to see that all of us are on this lifelong journey of trying to figure out together what it means to follow Jesus. And kind of all in one moment, we are all somewhat teachers and learners in this process. When we look at the form of mission that Jesus modeled, we see a model that is continually in motion. It's engaged in different places, and it acknowledges and values what each person brings to the relationship. Jesus preached in his hometown, after all, but then he also traveled to places where people from his community maybe wouldn't have been welcomed or wouldn't have been expected to go. He engaged with the political and religious leaders of the day, but he also made sure that those who were disregarded in society, like the poor and the lepers, the demon-possessed and the sick, the hungry, the women, the children, and those of different ethnic backgrounds, he made sure that all knew that they were seen and worthy of God's love. So when he gave these final words to the disciples, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, he is sending them out to engage alongside of others in this lifelong journey of Christian formation, where they will all need to recognize that they are all God's children and all have been empowered by this great commission. When we see others as less fortunate, or perhaps only as the receivers, and us only as the givers, it keeps our way of living and understanding the world centered, and it keeps others on the margins. And I just don't think that that's what Jesus was imagining. And when we follow Jesus in this way, we might overlook the gifts and abilities that others have to share, that others have been commissioned to share. So if we are going to follow Jesus, we will need to continually re-examine ourselves and our perspectives, our judgments, and our actions to see if we are following the Savior who taught us to look at all people, especially the poor and the marginalized, as made in the image of God and worthy of love and belonging, worthy of being offered a place at the table, or preparing the table themselves. I wonder how our perspective of this scripture might change as we read it from these various angles. I wonder how our understanding of making disciples and practicing Christ's mission in the world would expand if we imagined others who are living across the hall from us, across town from us, across the world from us, being commissioned to help us be formed into Christ's disciples? Or what if we imagine all of us being formed together? What if we went into every new relationship or place looking for the ways that others could teach us what it looks like to follow Jesus, as well as looking for ways that we could share God's love? What if we imagined a a child or a teenager or a college student in our community being commissioned to help one of our older adults follow Jesus more faithfully? Or what if we imagined one of our neighbors sitting on the church benches being the very one that Christ has called by name to come and help teach us about God's love? And also vice versa. What if we imagine this great commission at work in every exchange and every relationship with a neighbor or a stranger, in something in which everyone has something to offer and something to receive. Perhaps then the Great Commission would actually become as great and expansive as the love of God which called us into this work of discipleship first. Friends, I hope that each and every day we answer the call to follow Jesus, and I hope each and every day we look around and notice how others are doing that same work, perhaps in different and varied ways. Friends, I hope that each and every day we seek out ways to join together with others on this lifelong journey of faith. And as we do, I pray that we would trust in Christ, God's love embodied in flesh and blood, who has promised to be with us now and always. Thanks be to God.
again. Jesus calls us, come, follow me. He spoke of turning the world upside down, where leaders were servants, hungry people were fed, prisoners were set free, sick people were healed, and peace ruled over hatred and war. To everyone he said, follow me, and I will show you the way to God. We have good news to share. Jesus commissions us to gather together with those from all around the world as we are being made into disciples of Christ every single day. Baptized in the name of God's love and grace. And teaching and learning all that Christ commanded. Repent. Rejoice and be glad. Let your light shine. Be reconciled. Do not fear. Seek God's kingdom first. Let the little ones come to me. Forgive one another. Love one another as I have loved you. I have good news to share with you. I have good news to share with you. I have good news to share with you. We all have good news to share.
Right. Christ has no body but yours. No hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes through which he looks with compassion on the world. Yours are the feet with which he walks to do good. Yours, Yours are, are the, the hands which through which he blesses, blesses all, all the world. world. Yours are the hands. Yours are the feet. Yours are the eyes. You are his body. Christ has no body now on earth but yours. Amen.